Dear colleagues, uh, we start our seminar, Kharkiv Chemical Seminar, and today our guest is Professor Yuri Gogotse. Uh, he was born and raised in Ukraine and received his PhD, Candidate of Science in Physical Chemistry from Kyiv Polytechnical University and Doctor of Science in Engineering from the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Uh, now he is a distinguished university professor and Charles T. and Ruth M. Bach, professor of material science and engineering at Drexel University. He also serves as director of the Drexel Nanomaterials Institute. His research group works on the discovery, characterization, and processing of two-dimensional car carbides and nitrites, maxines, nanostructured carbons and other nanomaterials for energy, water, and biomedical application. He is recognized as a highly cited researcher in chemistry and material science and citation laureate in physics by Web of Science. He received numerous awards for his research. He has been elected as a fellow of the World Academy of Ceramics, European Academy of Science, American Association for Advancement of Science, Material Resource Society, and many other. He holds honorary doctorate from Paul Sabatier University in France, Kyiv Polytechnic University, Summa State University, and Francevich Institute for the Problem of Materials Science of National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. And dear Professor Gogotse, please, you can start your uh, talk. Well, Professor Chimanov, thank you very much uh, for your kind invitation. I'm honored to have this opportunity to talk to you about a large family of two-dimensional materials that we discovered with my colleagues and students at Drexel University uh, more than a decade ago. Uh, but before I talk about maxines, these are the structures you can see here in our book on maxines and a few samples of real materials. I would like to say a couple of words about myself. I was indeed born and raised in Kyiv, got all my degrees uh, from Ukraine, and I stay affiliated no, or not only through honorary degrees, but I've been lecturing at Summa State University, uh, having an adjunct position uh, there, I teaching classes, collaborate with Ukrainian scientists, and try to keep really close links to Ukraine. So, my family is from Kyiv, actually. This is a picture was taken just a couple of months before the war started, where I'm here in front of the Kyiv Polytechnic uh, main building with my father, George Gagotsi, uh, who just a couple of years ago retired from the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. He uh, was working at the Institute for Problems of Strength, and he still lives in Kyiv. And my brother, Oleksiy Gagotsi, uh, who is also a researcher, has a candidate of sciences, PhD degree. My father is doctor of sciences, but my brother runs a research company, uh, Material Research Center Ukraine, and another company, Y Carbon, that keeps working in Ukraine, producing materials, conducting research uh, using support from grants here. So again, I'm really closely affiliated with Ukraine, Ukrainian researchers, and I am delighted to be here and also see people not only from Kharkiv, but from other parts of Ukraine join the seminar, but also researchers from other countries, other parts of the world. For people who don't know about Drexel, uh, for whom the name of Anthony Drexel may be less familiar. He is the founder of the university. He gave money to build the, the first building, start the university. And you can see style-wise, Kiev Polytechnic and Drexel buildings are somewhat similar because Drexel University was built just a decade before Kiev Polytechnic, about the same era. And um, Anthony Drexel was a rich entrepreneur banker who founded the modern financial system. Basically, you see the man who ma made Wall Street together with JP Morgan. And he donated money for the university here. So to read more about our research, you can go to our website, nana.materials.drexel.edu. 
you will find plenty of information about our university, our institute and research we do. My lab is in much more modern building. It's a building actually occupies entire floor in this building, which was built by AMP, the same architectural company that created pyramids of Louvre. This is where my lab is currently located. So what I'm going to talk about today are nanomaterials and more specifically two-dimensional materials. I am currently in France at a conference where people talk a lot about graphene, metal dichalcogenides, and other materials. But in fact, what many people don't really appreciate that there are numerous two-dimensional materials. Moreover, they cover the range from dielectric, like boronitride, for example, to numerous semiconductors like chalcogenide, molydisulfide, tungsten disulfide, to semi-metallic materials, zero band gap semiconductors like graphene. And we added a large family of truly metallic materials, nitrides, carbides of transition metals. You can see an example here. Those are nanometer thin flakes or thinner than nanometer of 2D materials. Why are all these materials attracting so much attention? Because you can look at them as like a building blocks for future technologies. Nanometer thin flakes can be easily like a Lego stone on bricks in the walls combined creating heterostructures. We can build out of them, creating artificial new materials, covering wide range of optical, electronic properties. And if we have dielectric, semiconductor, metallic materials, we can build all kinds of electronic devices as well. So basically for people who still believe that graphene is the only important 2D material, it's important to understand there has been over past decades, actually, the paradigm change moving from single wonder materials, like used to be, say, bronze in Bronze Age or iron in Iron Age or silicon over the past uh, decades, which enables us, enabled basic electronics. Or later, people talk about fullerenes, nanotubes, and graphene. No. In fact, we are moving to a new era where we can assemble materials using two-dimensional building blocks with any properties, with combination of properties that are simply not possible in any material. And hopefully we can build it from solution in environmentally friendly, least expensive way. Now, let me move closer to materials which are in the center of my presentation. Maxines. M stands here for a transition metal. Titanium, niobium, moly, vanadium, others. X stands for carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, non-metallic element. The suffix in simply means like graphene. Silicine, germanine, borophene. While graphene got actually this suffix from organic chemistry, all 2D materials being produced, phosphorine, others, just simply called this way to show their two-dimensionality. So consider them to be graphene-like carbides and nitrides of transition metals. So how do they look like? The golden atoms here are M, metals. The black dots here are X, carbon, for example. They are very thin, like other 2D materials, nanometer thin or less. But there is very important distinction. Majority of them are good metals. Conductive carbide or nitride core, D electrons of transition metals, provide this material's metallic conductivity. Recall, graphene which is often presented as a very good conductor. In fact, no, is not a metal. It's a zero band gap semiconductor. 
it needs to be doped to provide carriers. Maxins, like titanium carbide, the first one discovered, shown here by Michael Nagib, who was PhD student, working with Professor Michelle Barzum and myself at Drexel. Maxin titanium 62 is a real metal with a high density of state at the Fermi level with a high concentration carrier. But maxins are also very unusual metals. You probably know that transition metals, let's say titanium, will not stay in environment non terminate So as soon as exposed to environment, they acquire surface termination. I am showing hydroxyl group here, but there can be oxygen, can be uh, halogens, chalcogens, and many others. So most of them look like conductive plate considered. The two-dimensional flakes with metallic, truly metallic conductivity, but they have transition metal oxide or hydroxide on the surface, so water soluble. You can look at them like a water dispersible metals or conducting clay, or again, materials with unusual combination of properties. And also transition metal oxide can be reduced, oxidized, modified on the surface, Functional groups can be attached, so we can play the games. One cannot play with other materials. But moreover, they come in a variety of structures with, say, two, three, four layers of transition metal. One, two, or three layers of carbon nitrogen. So we call them two, one, three, two, four C structures. Even better, we can have many transition metals but we can mix and match, make, for example, like alloy-like structures. Solid solution on M side, for example, titanium, niobium, or vanadium and chromium. And also solid solution on X side, for example, carbon nitride. So you can imagine already how many materials can be produced in this system. And actually, back in the time I was in Ukraine, first at Kyiv Polytechnic, then later at the Institute of Material Science of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. I worked on carbides, nitrites, and barides, but bulk materials. Here, we take them to lower level. For two decades after becoming a postdoc in Japan, I worked on carbon nanomaterials. And now I'm kind of a back to carbides and nitrides, but in two-dimensional state, similar to carbon nanomaterials. Here. And those are maxines. So before I go into further scientific and technical details, first of all, for younger scientists who are listening to me today, I think it's very important to understand how discoveries are made, how some people discover fullerenes or separate graphene or make something else new unknown before. One thing is here, you should not be afraid to work at the cutting edge when there is no guarantee of success, when you don't know where the result will come or not. Basically, you need to learn to fail. Fail, fail, fail. Because if you don't fail in your experiments, in your research, you are too conservative. You study something that is sufficiently well-known or too easy. And really, whenever it comes to discoveries, failure is truly the path how you get to success. And I'm citing here, actually, a very famous chemist. Uh, I'll show his name in a moment, who told that serendipity is the accidental discovery of something fortunate, often when you're looking for something entirely different. This is exactly how it happened to Maxine. And the person who uh, told this is Barry Sharpless. And since this is a chemical seminar, I'm sure many of you know that he just recently last year got his second Nobel Prize in chemistry 
for click chemistry that time here. So it's not only in material science, material chemistry that I'm practicing. This is actually true for all fields, but you need to study, you need to work because as long before Louis Pasteur said, where observation concern, good luck favors only the prepared mind. So it's accidental often, you find something you're not looking for, but you come to it here. Now, let me tell you a little bit how maxines were discovered. We were not looking to discover to decarbide the nitrides. We were trying to get lithium into titanium silicon carbide, a max phase so known, that was developed largely by my colleague, Michelle Barzum at Drexel University. And we could not implement the idea I had about using titanium silicon carbide in lithium ion battery. Lithium did not want to go in. So we try to etch max phases to make room for lithium ions. And as a result of this etching, we made first maxine titanium carbide. As I showed you, we obtained this structure after exposing titanium-3, aluminum C2 to hydrofluoric acid. You see those lamellas are actually not single layers. Those are multi-layer lamellas. This material has not been delaminated. It looks like thermally expanded graphite or vermeer to light clay. And also another important lesson for especially younger scientists, scientists who are working in Ukraine or elsewhere, and they're trying to get their important interesting research into top journal. When we submitted this paper, and we submitted it first on discovery of maxines, two-dimensional nanocrystals produced by exfoliation of titanium aluminum C2 to a couple of top journals, it got rejected without review. We discovered maxines in the wrong time, 20, 10 at the 2010. The first paper was published next year. Everyone was excited about what? Graphene. Because Gaiman Avasolov just got their Nobel Prize for separating single layer graphene from graphite crystals. Everyone was talking about graphene. Couple of other 2D materials already attracted attention, silicon, German, and vermeil. For many, maxines look like just another 2D material. So after rejection from the very top journals, I talked to Lorna Stimson, who was a redactor of adv editor advanced materials at the time, convinced her to send the paper for review in advanced materials. She sent it for review, and we received three low warm reviews telling, well, yes, uh, it looks like a another two-dimensional material, but can you study this, this, and that? And the paper got rejected. And we did not want to agree with this. We asked for adjudication review. And 10 years after, when we were working on an issue of advanced materials celebrating 10 years of discovery, I was told the name of the reviewer after my request, he agreed. This was Professor Vincent Munier. And actually we are with him right now at a conference. And I should have replaced this picture because I took a picture with him uh, like an hour before my talk. So he wrote, it is very clear that the results shown in this manuscript are very important and the successful isolation of new two-dimensional crystal by itself should warrant publication in prestigious journal such as advanced materials. Just to mention, this paper for the past three years has been the most cited article in advanced materials, which is one of the most cited journals, definitely the most reputable journal in the entire materials field with impact factor well over 30. And our actually first review article on Maxine's is the second most cited paper in advanced materials based on three years of research of uh, over a thousand papers published every year in this journal for the past more decades. So, so you see, 
whatever you make, it may be important, but it doesn't mean that community will right away embrace. Of course, now situation is different. Last uh, October, the editor in chief of Nature Nanotechnology wrote an article about of Maxine's showing how quickly finally after initial very slow recognition attention started to grow to Maxine. Now this is the only family of materials where actually there is like exponential growth in the number of publications, while graphene, nanotubes, chalcogenides are already slowly going down here. And in spite of this, it's still like about 70% of work done on single maxine titanium 3C2, the first one we discovered. Other maxines received much smaller percentage of attention. So there is plenty of room for you for discovery. Now, let me go to a little bit more technical detail. So how do we make these materials? We typically prepare them by selective etching. We take ceramic materials, which initially was max phase coal, like for example, titanium three aluminum C2. We etch away a layer, monatomic layer of element, like aluminum here. Why do we need etch? Why can we take the structure, see a high resolution image uh, here, and simply delimitate it mechanically? It's very difficult. It's unlike graphene or molydisulfide. There are strong chemical bonds here. We need to break these bonds. It's easier to do it chemically. You cannot delaminate it into single sheets mechanically. But after we etch it, maxine layers of carbides or nitrides or carbonitrides, uh, whatever was in, in the initial structure, acquire surface termination of oxygen OH. Now you see these sheets become loosely bonded. The layer of aluminum has been removed. Now there are weak van der Waals or hydrogen bonds between the layers. So they can be delaminated by intercalation, sonication, other techniques, just like other layered materials like graphite, for example, or molybdenum or clay. And after that process from solution, the single phase. There are many ways to make maxine nowadays. I mentioned wet chemical etching, which is still the most widely used process also industrially scaled up. But it's possible to use emulsion salt. We showed it for the first time for titanium nitrate synthesis. The technique has been improved using um, non-fluoride salts, using Lewis acid salt mix. But at the end of the day, you still end up with multi-layer maxine particles that can be intercalated and delaminated. So what is important? The process is scalable. And whether we use uh, motion salt or we use aqueous etching, we get different terminations. For example, in case of motion salt, typically halogens, chlorine, bromine, Iodine, fluorine. In case of aqueous etching, typically it's a mix. Oxygen, OH, fluorine, for example. Things like the reactions are fairly straightforward. Aluminum is etched. It can be, again, gallium. It can be silicon, several other elements. Carbides is produced. Surfaces get terminated with whatever is in the environment. Now, keep in mind, of course, that if you etch it using a chef, or HF derivatives, uh, uh, for example, ammonium hydrofluoride or mix of different acids with HF and fluoride. Uh, fluoride uh, actually is important for removing aluminum uh, and complexating it and removing it from interlayers. You deal with dangerous agent. You need to keep this in mind when working with it. Was published a paper in ACS Chemical Health and Safety to address this issue. We also published multiple articles like this review, this review to address details of synthesis and characterization of Maxine. So if you go to our papers, you will see many papers describing the method. And I bet 
you can take it, read it, and you will be able to reproduce the process in your laboratory. And of course, there are many different transition metals. There are many max phase and other layered precursors. And we cannot go experimentally through each of them. You see how long are the list of possible metals and considered to be nitrides, carbon nitrides, considered to be solid solutions, and so on here. But it's possible to theoretically predict if the MA bond is weaker than MX bond in carbide and nitride, you can etch it and break it. If MA bond is stronger than MX bond, you won't be able to produce this material by selective etching. You will need to use CVD or other techniques. But this allows us to predict what is possible, what is not. What's important? Let's just do very simple math. This is our editorial with my former uh, postdoc, Babak Suri, published just like uh, four years ago, 2019, actually less, than August 2020. You will see that what we had at that time was a dozen of transition metals, carbon and nitrogen, and three different structures, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, hydrogen, basically OH, hydroxyl, were known as possible termination. We actually mark them with the letter T because they can be mixed ones. Just a bit later, we published another editorial. 2021, two years later, we already added lanthanides that can replace scandium yttrium. We, instead of three, have 10 different surface termination, oxygen, all halogens, chalcogens, hydroxyl amino groups. And actually now we can also add oxygen to X. Let us do simple math. Take four base structures, dozen of transition metals, carbon nitrogen. You end up with a hundred of possible structures. Add 10 different specific surface termination, 1,000 possible stoichiometric compositions. If you take solid solution, infinite number. But all these green elements, they can be intercalated between maxine sheets, further modifying properties of this material. And of course, new materials are being in the system discovered, if not every day, certainly every week. We have, for example, a paper under review in Journal of the American Chemical Society describing 16 carbon nitride vaccines, nine of which have not been reported before. And as you can see at publications now, actually Asia is leading, China, Korea, uh, India, Japan as well involved with more than 10,000 papers, but Europe, US, other countries in the world, all together based on web of science, 87 countries. And those data were collected a couple of months ago in March. Of course, if you look at Google Scholar, uh, probably the number of countries will be over uh, 100, and there will be another uh, probably 30, 40,000 papers, uh, which are not listed in web of science. And of course, new types of maxine being added here. It's possible to make not only structures I show it to you, M2X, M3X2, M4X3, M5X4, but also structures where there are alternating different elements, something we called IMAX or in-plane ordered maxine structures, different elements being in surface layer, for example, scandium and tungsten. It's possible to make structure out of plane order. When outer layer is, for example, moly, and inner layer of transition metal are titaniums. So it's possible to make also with five layers, hair and bone structure, like a twin structure of the materials. And actually we reported the first one like a three years ago, and we have a paper now under review again with two more materials in the system. Basically, we have a very quickly growing family of material, but it's not just a family. 
we're really moving to conceptually different way of synthesis of materials. We're not taking single element or an alloy in single materials. We do atomistic design of materials, which hopefully with machine learning, artificial intelligence, combining all the computational techniques, we will be able to predict property, then synthesize the structure we want to have. Single element, solid solution, high entropy maxine where four, five different metals mixed in the structure randomly, or this type of a higher order maxines with twin five layer structure or out of plane ordered atomic sandwiches, I call them, or in plane ordered materials. Or if you etch away one of the elements for in plane ordered materials, you get basically like a rows of monatomic vacancies, double vacancies on the surface. So again, sky is the limit for sure. So we are really moving to a new era of atomistic design of materials with maxines. And moreover, the system expands further. People showed formation of two-dimensional borides, call them M-beans, for example. Maxines or chalcogenide, dichalcogenides. You can have actually the best of the both world. It's possible to make maxines, which will have on the surface not oxygen, but sulfur termination or tellurium or selenium. So it's a kind of a carbide terminated with sulfur or another element. You get basically like a carbochalcogenide. So you get carbide with the surface chemistry like in chalcogenide. Here, this work was published actually by a group of Michael Nagib, which is currently a professor at Tulane University, used to be a student in Drexel when we discovered the first vaccine. This is our paper uh, recently published in Science with colleagues from China and Sweden reporting on so known chemical scissors, where we can on demand do replacement of elements in the A layer by using molten salt, lewd acid molten salt. This is what LAMS abbreviation stands for. And we can get different elements between the layers of max phase removing elements, making vacancy, substituting by elements. And also we can make maxine with variety of surface termination. Again, halogens, but also phosphorus, antimony, halogens, chalcogens. So basically further explaining the range. So we take max phases, layer structure I showed to you, put them into emulsion salt, etch away one element, get inside another element. Actually, even noble metal, you can get gold inside of niobium carbide between the layers or antimony. It can be two atomic layers instead of one. And then we can etch away again monatomic layer. Imagine over 10, 30, 40 microns, we can etch monatomic layer away. And then get terminations we want. For example, here is Niobium terminated with tellurium, tantalum carbide terminated with selenium, or for the first time, antimony termination shown on tantalum carbide. And of course, those are just a few examples of chemistries that we can achieve here. This paper was published uh, uh, in Science in March. And next week, there was another paper published accompanied by this article on direct synthesis of carbide maxines from graphite and chemical vapor deposition, carbide and nitride maxines by Dmitry Talapkin from University of Chicago. It was on the cover of science, actually featured this work in the latest issue of uh, uh, Physics Today for people who are members of the American Physical Society here. And again, it's continuous, you know, like a three papers in science just during that uh, month. There are many more opportunities. Last year, it was actually published in November 2022, together with Polish collaborators. We showed that we can make oxycarbide maxines where up to 30% of carbon atoms can be replaced by oxygen forming oxycarbide. 
and the family keeps growing. We have another new group of materials discovered recently. We are just patenting it. Hopefully, we'll be able to write an article in a couple of months. Here. Few things that are important. Initially, vaccines were plagued by relatively low environmental stability. Even so, we always used to make them from aqua solution, from water, just basically dispersing water. But now we can make materials that can stay for 10 months in solution, dilute solution. You see, for example, Raman spectra of titanium 32 maxine, several months is no changes. Single flakes laying on a silicon substrate, sorry, gold coated silicon substrate, stored over two months in just a Petri dish. You see no changes in atomic force microscopy images. Raman spectra show it's still maxine. Different background was a result of different uh, tip used for terse analysis. Yeah. So what is important? They are stable. They can be used in environment. It's very important for many practical applications. We can make clutch flakes. We can make flakes with the size actually up to 40 micrometers. You can make graphene with this size. I've never seen titanium or molydisulfide or other chalcogenide or oxide or other 2D materials produced by solution processing with this size because of mechanical properties. Maxines are stronger than any other solution processed materials, including actually reducing graphene oxide and graphene oxide. Now, we started making Maxine in a beaker as one of my students showed in this hand-drawn picture. However, we use reactors. Actually, these reactors were designed by us, by a company my brother um, uh, founded, Materials Center, and we can make up to 100 gram per batch of materials. You see here titanium 3C2, you see here 40 gram of Atomic sandwich maxine, like this one, moly to titanium C2, doesn't matter which one, uh, more exotic or more common, you can make it in the point. And this is one of my students, Gita Valoroso, holds one kilogram of titanium residue maxine produced within 24 hours in our lab. Within the next 24 hours, it was completely delaminated in two-dimensional single to few layer flakes. And what is important, Maxines have high negative zeta potential below minus 30 millivolt at close to neutral pH. What it means is that you can disperse them again, unlike graphene, but very similar to graphene oxide in water without any surfactant, any additive. And you see different Maxines also will give you different colors because they have different electronic structure. So we take ceramic powder, put it in solution or emulsion salt, etch it, disperse in water, and we get colloidal solution of 2D flakes. And as you can see from this movie, and I hope it will play. Doesn't fall, but now it plays. You can see Maxine disperses in water. We can make dilute colloidal solution for injured printing or liquid crystalline, actually highly concentrated, like honey-like solution for doctor blading or for drawing fibers. And here you can see, for example, 160 liter of colloidal solution of maxines standing in our laboratory. So what's important and message from this this material is highly scalable. The process is scalable. And we can make maxine dispersion again just in water, which is again, we don't need to burn binder after printing or something else. And we can use any methods known of processing to make maxine ink, inkjet printing, writing, 3D printing, spray coating, spin coating, deep coating, interfacial assembly of monolayer flakes. What is also important? So we have almost infinite number of compositions, variety of structures. We can process materials in quantities, make it really scalable technology for many applications. We can have materials 
dispersed in water, processed from water, which is the cheapest solvent. But what is also important, if you look at titanium, aluminum, silicon rich, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen in the backbone, fluorine, chlorine, sulfur termination, those among the most abundant elements, which we have in more than sufficient supply, even vanadium, zirconium, niobium, moly, are closed in availability. So what it means that we can really make them in quantities. And Ukraine is, or at least used to be, one of the largest producers of titanium because of titanium ores available. So Ukraine can be a leader in manufacturing vaccines. And those materials are available for practical application. And the last but not least, it's great to be able to make infinite number of new two-dimensional bricks for building something. Great to make them in easily scalable method, process from water, and make out of abundant elements. But it all makes sense. Only if properties of these materials are better than other materials. And actually, they are. I already gave you an example of conductivity. We get actually over even 20,000 cement per centimeter. A reduced graphene oxide typically has two to 4,000. So material which is used in such multi-layer films for various conductive application films is 10 times less conductive than maxim. And you don't need to reduce it. You just process and dry the film. You don't need to heat it up. You don't need uh, to... Uh, do special treatment from graphene oxide to go to conduct structure. But keep in mind, combination of metallic conductivity, hydrophilicity is truly unique. But they're stronger than other solution process to the materials. They also come in a variety of colors and you have seen them. Transparent and thin film, electrochromic films, plasmonic applications, many others are enabled by this. And of course today, I won't be able to go over many applications and properties. But again, one very, very important feature. All those properties are not given to you in one material that you just get graphene and it's conducting. And you get boronite trial and it's dielectric and it is what it is. All these properties are tunable initially by structure, number of layers, transition element carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, mixing different elements in solid solution, surface termination on the surface, intercalation of ions or molecules. And actually you can graft molecules on the surface of maxine. And again, unlike in graphene, you won't kill conductivity. You get OH on graphene, making graphene oxide and six, seven orders of magnitude down in conductivity. Maxine stays conducting. But surface termination also affects properties. You get hydroxyl, and the work function is close to two electron volt. Very important for tuning for devices. You get oxygen. It goes close to six. Fluorine, about middle, four. So we can tune the work function for solar cells, for all ions, basically matching it to the semiconductor we use. They can come in a variety of complementing colors. Titanium to see, Maxine, is red in solution, green in reflection. Just a gold nanoparticles, but there is no gold there. It's just titanium and carbon, two of the most abundant elements. And of course, if you know the structure, if you know the composition, if you understand the chemistry of material, you can always find applications. For example, we can use controlled gap for water desalination, purification. We can use it for transport of ions in battery supercapacitors. We can use transition element on the surface for redox energy storage because those are vanadium, titanium, niobium, same elements that you use in batteries and supercapacitor electrodes that can reversibly change their oxidation state and the conducting carbide nitrate core can quickly conduct electrons, providing rapid electron transfer. So you look at the properties and you 
strived at that to determine application. In my group, we work a lot on energy storage. Actually, Maxine were discovered, as I mentioned to you, while developing Maxine's uh, materials basically for battery anodes. What everyone wants to get? Everyone wants to get, as this Aragoni plot shows, to high power and high energy at the same time. Have power and quick charging within like a seconds to minutes of electrochemical capacitors, but have energy density of batteries. Basically, a battery that you can charge in minutes or seconds, just plug in and take out, and that will store energy as much as current batteries. What do we need to achieve this? We certainly need redox. Without electron transfer, you cannot get high energy density. Maxins offer redox capable transition networks. You need fast transport of ions because slow solid state diffusion will never allow you fast to have fast charging. Two delayers. There is no bulk. Every atom here is on the surface. And there are channels for transport between. But moreover, one thing that people often forget, what does it mean fast charge? It's mean, it means that you run high current through the material. I know it's chemistry seminar, but not physics, but probably much everyone knows probably that what happens if you put high current through a poorly conducting material, Joule heating. Maxines are the most conducting of all materials ever used in energy storage. Actually, order of magnitude or two more conducting and activated carbon used in the fastest devices today, supercapacitors. So you can have very fast energy storage. Moreover, depending on composition, again, we can select double air storage, no desalvation, partial desalvation, pseudo capacitive, or intercalation like in battery anodes. Biomedical applications. There are lots of those applications emerging. I won't have time to go in detail. I'm referring to a review of a colleague from the University of Pennsylvania published in MRS Bulletin uh, in, uh, I believe, April this year. Here, again, number of paper grows quickly. We published this work last year showing of epidermal electronics, but they use for photothermal therapy implantable electrode, antimicrobial coatings, wound healing, intraocular lenses, regenerative medicine, DNA sensing, you name it. We work with colleagues from Summa State University on a number of biomedical applications of Maxence. Electromagnetic interference shielding, again, depending on composition of the material, we get different properties, including a record-breaking one, outperforming not only carbon by another or two of magnitude, but also even metals like copper, which have higher conductivity. Electronics. People already talk about entire field of maxine-based chemically assembled electronic maxitronic. And this roadmap was published in a leading journal from Cell uh, Group uh, just a couple of months ago, 2022, roadmap to building electronics beyond conventional chips. So I know I have used most of the time given to me a couple of comments. I'm not going to give specific conclusions. What I want to tell you, we have this enormous new family of materials that was discovered a little bit more than a decade ago. We're really in the beginning of the road. You may remember from uh, diagrams I showed to you that Really, number of publications started to grow quickly just about five, six years ago. So really, we're truly five with a thousand of stoichiometric composition and infinite number of possible other composition. Imagine how little we still know. Only about 50, 60 maxines have been reported so far, studied of this infinity. We still poorly know how to basically control surface functionalities and what impact of each of them will have on properties. 
I didn't even talk about today by defects, point defects, substitution, for example, carbon by oxygen, nitrogen, how they affect the properties. We need to map all possible properties. People still learn and 70% of work was done on single maxine titanium 32. I show to you we can improve stability of titanium 32, but there are still other materials which are less stable, at least in solution. We need to understand better how to control defects, for example, to improve stability. Can we do a rational design of hybrid materials? Combine maxine with graphene, chalcogenides, oxides. For application, when use advantages of different 2D materials. And of course, in the nano world, everything is on the surface. So interfaces, junctions between materials with different work functions, with different chemistries, for example, one hydrophobic and other hydrophilic, they will determine many of the properties. And there are many theoretical predictions. I did not talk about today, first of all, about first of all concerning the physical properties. Some very interesting properties, in addition to conductivity I talked about today, like a superconductivity, chemically controlled, has been demonstrated. Niobium carbide with selenium on the surface is superconductor. Replaced with oxygen, superconductivity disappears. Two-dimensional ferromagnetism, antiferromagnetism have been predicted still to be demonstrated and many, many other properties, topological insulators, so on. Same thing is with applications. We don't really know which of application, electric water filtration, energy storage, gas sensing, for example, uh, breath analysis, epidermal electronics, brain electrodes, implants, Printed electronics, organ on the chip, strain sensors, electrochemical actuators, antennas, printable antennas, printable electronics. What will be the killer application? They are still to be explored. So there are so many opportunities for anyone interested, independent, you're a chemist or physicist or material scientist. Whether you work, for example, on breast analysis, electrochemical energy storage, or trying to understand the function of a human brain, there is room for research on Maxine. But what is nice, Maxine are already making their way to practical applications to industrial production. In the field, like again, communication, storage, shielding, medical applications from DNA sequencing, to wearable kidney, uh, to sensing, optical sensing, resistive sensing, chemical sensing, optoelectronics, environmental as applications. And also, there is also Maxine Association. You can sign up for a newsletter on www.maxines.org. And this association is expected to bring together users from industry and academia. And if you learn, want to learn more about Maxence, we will be teaching a course in the beginning of August, second week of August, five hours a day, five days a week, how to make and characterize Maxine. You can either uh, use uh, this QR code or you can go to our website. I will show you at the end to find a link to this course. One more advertisement. Um, I'm helping uh, Springer Nature and my former postdoc Babaka Nasuri to build a new journal, Graphene and 2D Materials, which is official journal of both the Graphene Council and Maxine Association. And you are most welcome to submit your papers on Maxines, but also on other 2D materials, of course, to this journal. I publish myself, encourage you. We expect to have the first impact factor over 10 in this journal. So again, your high quality papers will be welcome. And this is my very final advertisement.
Every year for the past seven years, we have been running a non-artography competition again with Babak. And you can go to nonartography.org or just simply uh, put in Google non-artography, you will find the link. Deadline is usually submission in September, but what is important, you can, anyone from anywhere in the world can submit pictures. Many of these pictures ended up on book covers in our annual calendar elsewhere, and you can win prizes up to $1,000 for your scientific image transformed into art, and everyone is welcome to participate. We had Ukrainian participants and winners in the past. And this is my very, very last image. Of course, I would never be able to do all the work I've been doing without help of an excellent, outstanding team of students, postdocs, scientists, visiting researchers. They come from a dozen of different countries, including, of course, several people from Ukraine, my group, PhD students, senior researchers, visiting scientists. And we also collaborate with people around the world. I already mentioned a couple of times at Sumy State University. I showed you our work with Pavel Michalowski from Poland, but we work with people in many other countries. Science nowadays is interdisciplinary. It's rarely done by a single PhD student and his or her professor sitting in the lab. It's done by a large team of researchers working at prob on problems at interfaces between different fields. Here. So I encourage you to collaborate. I encourage you to explore opportunity in the world and work on exciting problems that you make your discoveries. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a nice and interesting presentation and lecture concerning 2D materials and application of these materials. And I think we have questions to the lecturer, please. Who would like to uh, ask? Also, don't hesitate to ask in Ukrainian uh, if you don't feel uh, comfortable asking in English. Good evening, sir. Yes. Um, I'm Janis, talking to you from India. Thank you so much for a good presentation, sir. Actually, I have a couple of questions. So one question is like, sir, as you were discussing about uh, uh, synthesizing of different vaccines, uh, some vaccines have been reported that they are pretty unstable, and that was the reason where they were not feasible to be put into some applications. Uh, and also, as per the Web of Science database, there was a paper on chromium-based vaccine, which is there, only one paper has been reported in that. So these kind of uh, un in unannounced gaps could be rectified as you said, when we actually explore. But I have a small query, sir. Uh, you were talking about a, um, a reactor, which was actually made by, designed by you and been has been commercialized perhaps by your brother. Uh, being in India, actually, we don't have that facility. In case if we try to actually procure, what could be the process? Can we actually approach your brother? Is there any kind of things possible? Oh, look, actually, it was designed by his company. You can go to mrc.org.ua and you can request an order reactor. They can design it for you or make an existing one, basically the same model. However, if you need to produce for research purposes, grammar two materials, a plastic bottle will work just fine. Of course, if you want to produce large amounts, you want to be safe, you want to have better control, you want to have reactor with steering and everything else here. But I don't think it's a problem. Second, you're absolutely right that there are many reports in the literature on different vaccines. Some of vaccines have been made, some not. For example, when we published this paper in Science 2021, high entropy materials were predicted but not reported yet. And they have been made, published since that, in the last two years. Many others. Chromium carbide vaccines, we could not make it. We're still working to make it because of very interesting predicted properties. I don't think reports on chromium carbide are correct. I think it's largely oxide that was made, layered to deoxide. Uh, it got oxidized. And the same with stability. I showed you some of the papers describing how to make, for example, V2C stable. 
this is a reference, this chemical material paper. For many years, we considered V2C maxine to be the least stable of all known maxines. And my PhD student, Kyle Matthews, showed in this paper that it's possible to make it like a stable for months in aqueous solution and definitely for years when you make a film out of it here. So it's a developing field. And you really need to realize that in any new field, there will be errors initially, there will be hype, and there are many gaps to fill. But this is what makes it also exciting because there is room for research for everyone. Doesn't matter, you're in India, Ukraine, or elsewhere. There are many things that can be done without having extremely fancy equipment. Like for example, just putting a plastic bottle uh, with a stirrer on a hot plate and cooking your maxine. Uh, sir, can I ask one more question, if your time permits? Yes, please. Yes, sir. One, one additional. Yeah, th thank you. Sir, actually, like, uh, regarding the X component uh, of uh, uh, the Mexine, most almost 90% of the paper, at least in my knowledge, whatever I've read, have discussed about etching of aluminium. Although we have a source where we could say that group three to six elements could be actually used, like uh, silicon, as an X component. Mm -hmm. What could be the reason that why they have not been much explored? Why only aluminum have been explored the most, uh, apart from being easily etched using hedges? There are several reasons for this. One is from practical standpoint, aluminum, you remember, mm -hmm. I showed you one of the most abandoned, cheapest elements. So yes, you can make uh, max phases with all these elements marked here in red, A group element. But clearly, aluminum by far is the cheapest, easier to edge. We actually, X again, you remember about serendipity uh, in research. We initially, Michael Nagib, try initially to make edge titanium silicon carbide maxine. And he failed, he could not, but he was able to edge aluminum. Seven years later, my other student, Mohammed Al Habib, was able to etch silicon because silicon you have to oxidize first. So you need to add an oxidizer to HF. So it's a slower process. You get more oxidized materials on the surface, which sometimes desirable, sometimes not. We can etch gallium, but from two layers, for example, moly carbide produced from moly to gallium to C. And there is no good reason why, for example, thallium cannot be etched. But do you really want to work with extremely toxic thallium? where you can etch aluminum. So I would say it's a matter of preference, but when I tell you, look, we can make 50 different maxines. We have a paper with 16 uh, carbonitride under review. It also means that making every new one take months of work for often more than one person, teams of students, postdocs. So it means that it's again an opportunity. You wanna show how to make other maxines develop protocol for etching silicon. Demonstrated here. You want to etch germanium or phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Try it. Look at it. Maybe phosphorus can be removed in a gas phase easier by oxidizing it selectively, for example, here. Or indium or other elements. So I think many things in the field have not been done not because they cannot be done. They simply have not been done yet. It will take someone to go to the lab and make it happen. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Igor Kamarov, please. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yuri, for this fantastic talk. Uh, I always wanted to get to it and uh, only Valentin provided such an opportunity. Thank you for agreeing. Uh, to to talk at this seminar my pleasure indeed and valentin for for inviting uh, my question will probably be layman's question uh, the methods of preparation of vaccines you talked about uh, could be mm, named as uh, could be classified as the top-down approach although probably this is not the appropriate term here but what what about the bottom up what are the prospects of uh, Mm -hmm. gradual constructing the layers using 
uh, epitaxy or other uh, methods developed in, in bottom-up approach. You, you, you told a little bit about that on slide 27, but what, what could be the advantages or probably opportunities of such an approach? Well, I think the main advantage of growing maxine on the surface, parallel to a substrate, like on silicon wafer, for example, is electronic application. For example, monolayer titanium 3C2, even with ox oxygen on the surface, has breakdown uh, current, uh, which is at the same level of graphene. So you can use it, for example, like a nanometer thin uh, uh, current collectors uh, or uh, interconnects and so on. So it's possible to make semiconducting maxine opening band gap by surface termination. So I would say for electronic applications, uh, potentially certainly interesting. People demonstrated growth of nanometer, two nanometer thin, molycarbide, several other carbides. But you cannot technically call them maxine because no one came up with like a self-terminating method of synthesis. So what it means is that they can grow two layers, three, four, five, in a kind of an uncontrolled way. But in my personal opinion, it's just a matter of putting effort. It looks today like it's absolutely like a obvious. Well, graphene can be grown on a wafer scale or on a large uh, copper foil by CVD. And people grow boronitride on wafer scale and molydisulfide. Go 10, 15 years back, there will be probably like hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, invested to just learn how to make graphene. People started with scotch tape, then used silicon carbide decomposition, which is actually similar to um, selective etching process, removing silicon, reorganizing uh, carbon into graphene. After that, growing on nickel foils as a method until copper foil was found to really generate maxine and how much effort went to really make it monolayer in large area. So I don't think there is anything impossible here. I'm not an expert in CVD, PVD, but people grow cubic carbides, people grow max phases actually by magnetron sputtering. So I think PVD, CVD technique, atomic layer deposition with annealing, uh, as a message should work here. It's just a matter again of someone going to the lab, setting it as a goal and making it happen. Because people grow to three nanometer films of Molly 2C, for example, it's possible. It's just a finding a way to make the process self-terminating after monolayer or two, uh, prevent uh, random growth and thickening of the film. Thank you. Alexander Ruch, please. Uh -huh. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you, Yuri, very much for the interesting lecture. A reporter, uh, my name is Alexander Ruch. I work at the Institute of Metal Physics uh, in Kiev. Uh, and uh, I have. My neighbor, used to be a neighbor in the past, at least. Neighborhood, yes. <laughs> Two short questions. The first one uh, What's the principal difference between Maxenas and uh, Mabins, Mabins, ma ma maybe I yeah. don't know. I yeah. don't. Know. Yeah. Uh, what? Uh, uh, maybe it is uh, play a role uh, electronic structure of boron uh, carbon. The first one, the next after your answer. Uh, sure. Uh, there are a couple of differences here. One is uh, again, you know, like I even spending more time that I wanted, I still didn't explain all details. Mm -hmm. If you look at Maxine layer. Maxine layer is basically like a one 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 slice mm -hmm. of cubic sodium chloride structure of conventional uh, carbides and nitrides of transition metal. And beans have a slightly different structure. So that's why they kind of were separated a little bit here. So structure arrangements of atoms in the layer is different. But of course, all of them have very different electronic structure and predicted different properties. Semiconducting in some cases here. Mm -hmm. Since this was like a chemical seminar, I did not talk about the electronic structure, really did not talk about properties here. But really the key thing in all these materials and the reason we make materials to achieve certain properties here. And 
having this tunability of properties, having tunability, for example, boron will be interesting, for example, for neutron applications here. Maxins have very, titanium carbide, for example, has very interesting, very low emissivity in the IR range, so you can make basically infrared stealth material, some other strong emitters. So I think it's all about finding material with the right properties, but MBINs have been much less studied. There are a small number of papers in synthesis, there are theoretical DFT prediction of properties, and very little in terms of practical application, so again, it is just the beginning of the field. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And the second one, uh, maybe you know about uh, practical uh, using uh, of Maxim in the metallurgy, uh, traditional metallurgy uh, or powder yeah. metallurgy. Uh, and and the se one more question. Next, your answer. Yeah. Uh, well. Um... There are a few papers. Actually, the first paper we published with Dmitry Talapin, the same professor from uh, 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 University of Chicago, uh, who uh, developed the CVD method for synthesis, this one. He is originally, by the way, from Belarus and very strong supporter of Ukraine. We published two open letters together with him. And we showed that by adding titanium 32 flakes to light alloys, like, for example, um, magnesium lithium alloys, which are considered as extremely light alloys. It's possible to increase modulus and strengths, tensile strengths, by about 70% without any loss in ductility. So it's a basically, you can look at this as a reinforcing element. And people either do for light alloy, like aluminum, magnesium, silicon carbide, Whiskers, others, which have their limitations, or try to use carbon, but carbon is not wetted by aluminum or magnesium. So as a result, poor wettability create problems with nanotubes, graphene, and they're very different to disperse. Maxines have good dispersibility. But the number of papers on composites, metal matrix composites with maxine basically is limited. Uh, uh, I don't know, a dozen of papers, probably less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the next, uh, thank you, thank you. The next one. I know you have a joint project with Academician Salonian uh, in development of new based uh, magnesium uh, ma uh, hydrogen storage material, materials with maxines. Uh, uh, my group uh, work in the same, uh, about the same uh, direction, and uh, we use uh, max phases. Uh, to improve uh, magnesium properties as uh, hydrogen storage materials. Uh, really, I don't know about results of uh, Professor uh, Solonin, but I, I think uh, uh, during uh, uh, <clears throat> the ball milling, uh, Max Fezis uh, uh, translated, sorry, uh, transformed it in um, uh, Maxines, I, I think. But it is very interesting uh, to use. Uh, 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 directly maxines as addition uh, to magnesium, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, really I have uh, uh, we can uh, produce the uh, uh, max phases, but uh, there is not possibility to produce the maxine in my laboratory. Yeah, Alexander. First, again, um, my actual material research center, uh, which is next door, it's on campus of uh, Institute of Prone Material Science, they make maxines probably like a 200 or 300 meters away from your laboratory. Mm -hmm. So they are available really like a next door. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, go to mrc.org and talk to them. But a uh, project with uh, Professor Salonian, unfortunately, kind of uh, never took off because it was planned before the war. Then a uh, researcher who started it uh, went uh, abroad, uh, Sergei Karablo, and uh, uh, we really did not have uh, much of collaboration. However, we do work on hydrogen storage in Maxine at the moment. I cannot tell details, but we are planning to submit a paper very soon with very unusual results. But it's really like a hydrogen in Maxine, let's talk. Application you mentioned as additive to, for example, hydride as a storage materials has actually been pretty well explored. There are 
dozens of papers with actually very promising result, greatly decreasing the temperature of hydride decomposition and radiation here. So basically improving efficiency here. Um, I don't work in this area myself, but I've seen very impressive and definitely trustworthy results. So it's good. And if you mill max phases, you don't get maxine, but you get something people call maxine. So it's a basically probably 10, 20, 30 nanometer lamellas of max phase, which for some application maybe have similarly and maybe good, for example, for enforcing metals here. So there is nothing wrong with this uh, as long as they give you properties that you need for your specific application. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. We are waiting uh, you in Kiev in Ukraine. We'll thank be glad to come again. Uh, Alek Kalugin, please. Uh, dear Professor Gogoti, thank you very much for the amazing presentation. Uh, as a dean of uh, the School of Chemistry and the professor of uh, Department of Inorganic Chemistry, I would like to ask you your recommendation uh, about any teach book or maybe reviewers which can be used in the course of inorganic chemistry or functional materials for students. Uh, look, uh, <laughs> uh, you uh, caught me uh, here I, where I really can't tell you much. And the reason is here, I'm actually um, in material science department. So teaching I do is uh, largely on material. And I must also confess to you all that my level of chemistry has been going downhills for a long time. And actually the peak of this was probably when I was in a chemistry club in uh, Palace of Pioneers in Kyiv, uh, in a basically chemistry club led by Sergei Michalovsky, who was at that time uh, uh, This was the time when I uh, was winning Olympiads in chemistry. Soviet exhibition in Moscow medal and so on here. Then I made chemistry, and this after that was more materials, materials, and materials here. So I won't give you an advice on inorganic chemistry book, but if you write to me, send an email, I'll be glad to talk to my colleague who teach inorganic chemistry. And uh, I have uh, some request and proposition. If we invite you uh, sometimes to give uh, a few lectures for our students in the uh, School of Chemistry, is it possible? Uh, it's possible in general. Again, you know, I've been uh, lecturing at Sumi State University. I will do my best to squeeze. I see Maria Nesterkina. Yes, Maria Nesterkina, please. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So first of all, thanks a lot for this fascinating biomedical application of your material, specifically the antibacterial um, potential. Could you please briefly describe, do you use the pure material for this investigation or you somehow absorb the antibiotics or in which way you provide this kind of research? Thank you. Um, actually, um, this work um, was done in collaboration with colleague initially from um, Qatar, and it started not with the medical application. It started with the goal to prevent fouling of mem uh, membranes for water desalination, to basically minimize growth of bacterial films. And then it was shown that maxine, pure maxine, has antibacterial properties. The mechanism exactly of the action is still being discussed. Whether it is um, simply, and again, what is interesting here, um, it shows antiviral and antibacterial properties here, but it depends on type of bacteria. It's a much better properties antiviral compared to larger bacteria. And again, as I mentioned here, there are still arguments about the mechanism of this. Is this a release of ions absorbed between the layers of maxines? Uh, is this like a cutting uh, uh, 
bacterial membranes by edges of maxine flakes or anything else here. Uh, however, combining it with very good biological compatibility, blood compatibility, cytotoxicity, it should definitely, in my opinion, be not a mechanical mechanism, but a chemical one. But which one, I don't think the community agrees on this yet. I see. So actually, you have used the pure material. Yeah, but this was pure material. But you can load it with drugs. For example, for uh, in photothermal uh, treatment, for cancer treatment, uh, people not only use photothermal effect, but absorb, for example, doxorubicin or other drug between maxine layers and deliver it to the cells. So potentially, yes, it is possible to load it. Maxine has a high negative zeta potential. So any drug molecules which are either positively charged, for example, having any amino groups, or uh, which have just enough, for example, uh, hydrogen bonding, uh, hydroxyl group, uh, carboxyl here, they will be absorbed on maxines and you can assemble them between layers of maxine. And the related question, so if it works perfect like antiviral or antibacterial, um, uh, materials uh, is it toxic have you conducted some experiments regarding the tox toxicity uh we uh particularly did not but many of my collaborators actually visiting scientists also as my group did and i think there is a strong agreement uh that at least titanium 3c2 uh niobium uh tantalum uh maxines vanadium maxines show no cytotoxicity there are multiple groups. Some of the leaders are probably Agnieszka Jastrzebski in Warsaw, University of Technology. Uh, she has published multiple papers. But actually in Ukraine, Professor Maxim Pogorelov and his group at Sumy State University, Maxim is now in Riga uh, working himself, but his group is very, very active at Sumy State University. They have done very uh, substantial systematic studies, but there are tons of papers by now from China, from uh, US, uh, including my colleagues, Flavia Vitale. Uh, many of the studies are done in parallel with other investigation. For example, this our paper with collaborator from University of Brighton, they also look, for example, on uh, toxicity of maxines for implantable interocular laser things here. So I think there is an agreement at least of those materials. However, keep in mind that there can be like a chromium maxins, which people are trying still to make. We can make chromium titanium carbide maxin, which may produce, for example, soluble chromium compounds. Vanadium based maxin can produce also some soluble compounds. And no one really looks systematically at all the possible treatment. For example, if you have Chlorine on the surface and chlorine titanium bond start hydrolyzing, producing active chlorine. So I think this may be responsible for antibacterial antiviral properties, but it may add inflammatory or toxic response cause here. So again, you cannot take bluntly that every maxine is safe to use and we treat them as any other new materials uh, safely. Yeah, thank you so much for the answers. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Grigory Dmitriev. Uh, dear Yuri, it's a, a, not will be a question, but like a continuation of proposal of my colleague, uh, Dean from Kharkiv. Uh, I think it will be uh, very good to discuss with you and synchronize such lecture with now everybody work in Zoom or Teams or something about ever. Uh, and such lectures can be very useful for all Ukrainian students in inorganic chemistry. I think it's well be, uh, when we start preparation uh, during the summer time, we can uh, discuss all, all deans uh, reading universities like in Kiev, Kharkiv, Lviv, Sumy. And uh, it will be uh, even you are more useful for you. You're not uh, necessarily more to... efficient. Fully yeah, agree. Of course, of Fully course. Agree. And during the summer time, we can uh, give you such ideas, a few topics. We can uh, discuss which topics will be more preferable for all uh, these universities. And I think that is a real, very good idea. Uh, sounds good to me because like everyone else, I only have 24 hours a day, seven of days course. a week. And if I stretch my day even to 16 hours as I do it now, it's still not enough to do everything I uh, need. And I know, like. I know. 
Like Dean, I know what to do. <laughs> yeah, we all are in the same position. You may understand me well, at least the senior researchers. And, yeah. and but during time, we can, uh, during summer time, we can prepare such proposals and discuss together with Oleg, with uh, another professors in Ukraine right. universities. Feel free to reach out. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Nice proposal. So, dear colleagues, other questions? Uh, yeah, Yuri, you said that Ukraine can be a leader in production of vaccines. Uh, what do you think about supporting of this uh, possibility? Do you have a plans to do this? Um, uh, look, I first, I do whatever I can do in many different ways. Uh, I won't like uh, uh, talk about all this, but I've been working with my colleagues to write proposals for European funding, joining various projects to help secure funding. I work uh, with uh, uh, my brother's company. And again, it's not like a, I'm just helping. It's a mutually beneficial work because they design reactor for us. They produce max phase uh, that is important for vaccine synthesis. Not only us, I think people in at least 200 research organizations around the world buy and use their max phase for making vaccines. So there are activities in Ukraine. But clearly taking into account the uh, dimensions of uh, titanium industry uh, in Ukraine, um, I think there are opportunities for really large scale production. Um, I'm, I left Ukraine in 1990. So I'm much less familiar than most of you with the current state of industry, with the current capability. I know some of the plants that were producing, for example, carbides, nitrites, are now in the on occupied territories that used to be in Donetsk or elsewhere. Uh, so um, this is again, I can tell you about materials like um, Carbon Ukraine, the company, Alexei company, they got a license for manufacturing vaccine, for example, from Drexel University. Others can do it too or collaborate with them and build production and there are applications both uh, application future technologies, applications uh, in uh, uh, biomedical health sciences, what, for example, Maxine Pogarelov's group at SUMI trying to do, or electronics, what we work on with other colleagues uh, uh, from uh, SUMI, uh, uh, with uh, uh, basically Department of Electronics, uh, Nanoelectronics there. Uh, but there are probably other applications. I mentioned, for example, infrared styles, mm -hmm. some others that may be of importance for Ukrainian defense industry. But I'm a university scientist. So yeah. basically I can provide ideas, like I share information, we publish a lot, but I'm not the one to go and build a plant in Ukraine tomorrow. Okay, I understand That's it. Basically, I think in the hands of Ukrainian business and research community. Yes, you are absolutely right. Thank you very much. I think we don't have other questions. So thanks again for a very, very fantastic talk today in our Kharkiv Chemical Seminar. Thank you. And I just wanted to show once again at the end a uh, link to our website. You will find my email. You also will find emails and contact information of my students, postdocs, who in many uh, cases much better than me and know more than me about specific materials, their properties, applications, feel free to reach out if you have further questions. And I wish all of you a great day. And I wish also uh, victory to Ukraine. Uh, all the best. Uh, Slava Ukraini. Heroim Slava. Do pobaczenia. Do pobaczenia. Do pobaczenia. Do pobaczenia.